Coming up on this week's show, how to get vintage gaming mags delivered to your door. A huge new documentary for classic FPS fans. And we talk to Activision and Coleco legend, Gary Kitchen. The Retro Hour podcast is brought to you each week with our mates at Bitmap Books. Now, you need to check out Super Famicom, the box art collection. This is an incredible compilation of Japanese game packaging images, professionally short presented as a glorious hardback book and features around 250 titles, including some that have never been seen or documented in print before. So you can check that out and lots more on their website at bitmapbooks.co.uk. Hello and welcome to the Retro Hour podcast, episode number 281, your weekly dose of retro gaming and technology news with me, Dan Wood. Me, Ravi Abbott. And me, Joe Fox. And great to have you joining us for the show that takes you back to the golden age of video games, exploring all of those titles that we grew up playing, the companies behind them, taking you behind the scenes and chatting to the people that actually made those games that we all played as part of our childhood. And today, we've got the most incredible guest coming up. We'll tell you more about that. But first on the show, our little gaggle of geeks, which I believe is the collective term for a group of geeks. Um, We're going to be getting our teeth stuck into the retro gaming and tech stories from over the last seven days. You know, it's quite funny, actually, because um, we've been doing this show remotely for a year now, which over a year, actually, since around March of 2020. But we've actually met up in person, I think, three times in the last two weeks. I, I was wondering where you were going with that, then, because I was like, I think our listeners know we do this remotely now. <laughs> but, <laughs> but yeah, no, um, we ha- I actually thought that the other day. So we went for a meal to, mm. and, you know, the idea was we we're going to talk about um, episode 300 and getting some guests, weren't we? Which is getting close. Um, which we ended up not doing. We just had the meal instead. <laughs> and a catch I, I, I'm just ignoring episode 300. <laughs> <laughs> and then, Rabbi's got it all sorted. Yeah, and then yeah, literally, <laughs> literally, yeah, yeah, yeah. Rabbi's got it. You've got this, mate. And then like f- three days later, it was my birthday. So you guys oh, came that, to my that, that was lovely. Yeah. We all, we all sat around and... Uh, Drank beers and had a chat. That was really nice. And we saw some other people as well that were involved behind the scenes with Retro Hour, which was kind of nice to catch up with. We did, we did. And then about a week later, me and Dan saw each other and we were meant to see Ravi as well, but it didn't go quite to plan, did it? (laughs) Well, I'm going to come around Dan's house and have a drink soon as well. There you go. uh, Drink him dry, yeah. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, Ravi put on his Amiga show. Me and you sat in my uh, little little office and played Super Nintendo games. I whooped your ass on um, Mortal Kombat, which I'm sure you're still stinging about. (sighs) You did whoop my ass on Mortal Kombat, and I'm not going to lie, I've actually been (laughs) playing Ultimate Mortal Kombat (laughs) um, (laughs) all week since we played it. (laughs) Ready for a rematch. Get the practice in, mate. You I need th- it. I think it's just that you've cemented into your brain Scorpion's moves, and they're always the same <laughs> on every game. On every, so you always just play Scorpion, wipe the floor with me. Scorpion is my boy. I must admit. So uh, that is how passionate we are. I mean, we live and breathe video games and retro games, which is why you know we've done the show now for five and a half years. But actually, there is something we need a bit of help with because you know we do this show. We record it, we put it out there. We hope that you guys enjoy it and, you know, we get a good reaction. But in the past, whenever we've tried to, you know, do like little surveys and polls and stuff on Facebook and Twitter, annoyingly, I mean, don't get me wrong, we really appreciate your feedback. When we ask questions like, you know, do you prefer the news or do you you prefer the interview section? They always come out 50-50. And it, and it becomes a war. It's like, I love the news. I (laughs) I love the interviews. No, the news. (laughs) It's hard to kind of judge judge the uh, feedback with that. Yeah, so now that we've been doing the show for you know more than half a decade, which is insane, we want to make it better for you. So we are launching our first ever Retro Hour listeners survey. Now, the idea is we just, we've just we asked you a few questions in here, find out a little bit more about you. It obviously helps us with you know getting advertisers for the show that are going to suit our audience. It also helps us create the content that you're going to enjoy as well. And it's not going to take you long to fill it in, probably around five minutes. And in return, you could actually win an amazing prize. Ravi's put his hand in his pocket. Yeah, well, um, it's, it's not just me, <laughs> but um, we were thinking like, we want to give a prize for this and, you know, get more people involved in the survey because the survey is not very good if you haven't got many people doing it. Yeah. But, um, you know, there's so much choice in the retro world. What could we get? And we were thinking, let's get this system. Let's get that. And actually, no, we'll just let you decide. So we're going to give away a hundred great British pounds. And uh, I guess this can be in any format to the, the random person that we choose 
that has won this and we'll put all the names into a random generator and then you'll have a hundred pounds or whatever kind of currency you're using to pick whatever you want you know you can spend it on a retro item it's a bit like those magazines where they used to go right we're going to give you a hundred pounds to spend and yeah. uh, just see what you get <laughs> so that is the idea really we want as many people as possible to take part in this survey obviously the more more of you guys that do the better we can make this show and tailor it to you and like ravi said then in return someone is going to win a hundred pounds to spend on retro goodies of your choice so we're going to keep this open until the end of next month the 30th of july will be the closing day and then we'll select someone at random you'll find the survey right now like i said it'll take you five minutes it's really really going to help us out so we'd hugely appreciate it and it's pinned to the front page of our website at the retrohour.com. Now today, we are going to keep that high standard that hopefully you expect from this show going, and we're going to be talking to a real veteran of the video games industry. Ravi and I spoke to Activision and Coleco legend Gary Kitchen. This is such a good interview. Oh, it's amazing because we've wanted Gary on the show from the very start, and uh, you know, we've had David Crane on before, and these guys are absolute legends. You know, Activision was one of the really early companies and Coleco and Gary worked with them, but he's also working with Absolute Entertainment as well. And, uh, you know, he's got a new company, Audacity Games, and they're actually making 2,600 games in the modern age. And they talked about stuff like the latest revival happening with, you know, Atari Age are creating games as well. So they've kind of been inspired by them guys. They've also got such a good history we don't just talk about atari stuff we we get onto a lot later stuff because gary's just done so much it's unbelievable yeah i mean all the companies he's been involved with i mean like you said then ravi the earliest days you know we're talking about coleco and activision and those games we were making on the atari 2600 and then you know going through his career games are i remember playing bart versus the space mutants and he was the lead on that project you know i used to love that on the amiga back in the day um, and also he worked on a Home Alone for the Super Nintendo, which isn't his fondest memory ever, but we, we talk about that as well. Skyworks Technologies, it was like a very early internet online gaming company that he set up back in 1995. And today, working again with David Crane and his brother Dan, and they've actually set up a retro game studio that releases Atari 2600 games in 2021 so it goes full circle and he's such a passionate guy so you're really going to enjoy this one gary kitchen is going to be our special guest on the retro hour podcast and he'll be coming up in around 20 minutes from now now lots of stories to get through this week before we do you know the weather's starting to get warmer here in the uk is there anything better than sitting outside in the sunshine in your garden maybe with your evercade or your nintendo switch and enjoying a nice beer in the sunshine we may no secret, we all enjoy the odd tipple now and then, don't we? I was going to say, we're going to start sounding like alcoholics, but, you know, <laughs> on a, it, it's hard not to with all these great offers that we keep getting. <laughs> now, this is our latest sponsor. Let's give a huge welcome to the crew at Beers UK. Now, this is B E E R Z. Dot UK. Now, they are an incredible online beer shop. From the guys who founded, you may have heard of the uh, Beerheads pub chain. There's one actually here in Nottingham, isn't there, in a Nottingham train station? I've been in there a few times when waiting for a train. Yeah, isn't it an old, like, Victorian kind of waiting room that they've converted yes. into a bar, <laughs> which, which is pretty cool because you can wait for your train. I think you can actually see when the trains are arriving on a little screen. Yeah, I'll be honest, whenever I'm getting a train, I usually get there maybe half an hour early just to go in there and re read an issue of Retro Gamer Magazine over a pint. And that's the thing about, you know, these guys are really passionate. I've been chatting to Chris and the crew here, and their aim is to bring beer from independent breweries around the UK and to Europe to your doorstep with 48-hour delivery. So you really are supporting the little guys. Yeah, and, you know, it's great. We're recording this podcast in Nottingham, and they're in Nottingham, and it's like supporting a local business and these like little independent breweries. It's really good to support them at this time. Absolutely. And now there's something for everyone as well, whatever your taste is, maybe you're into like, you know, velvety smooth stout that will slip straight down or maybe a nice strong 13% IPA that could even make an Atari ST an attractive proposition for you when browsing eBay late at night, Ravi. You never know what I could be DJing <laughs> with next. <laughs> <laughs> and, you know, they explore beers from all around the UK and Europe, maybe a Norwegian milkshake beer or maybe a peach and guava sour beer from our friends in Denmark as well. So 
I've actually got a box of their beers here, and you guys are going to laugh at the names that they come up with. Now, I've got to say, the box is incredible. Um, you get 12 beers in this box here that I've got, and they're actually full-size cans in this one they've sent me as well. What about this for uh, names of beers? We've got um, Superman's Big Sister. <laughs> nice. <laughs> <laughs> We've got um, Trial by Wombat as well, Alien Inc., which is a jet black IPA. And uh, if you look on their website, I mean, there's one they actually called Lockdown as well, which is an IPA, 4.5%. And the cans just feel really good quality. And, you know, you're going to get a bit of a giggle. You're going to enjoy the experience as well. And to celebrate the launch of their three monthly subscription boxes, they've actually got a competition going right now, haven't they? Yeah, this is a really easy competition. And it's proper wicked as well. All you need to do is head over to their Facebook page, which is Beers with a Z. Give the page a like. Find the competition post. Leave a comment on there saying what beer you'd want from either IPA, stout, or a mix. And they're just going to pick somebody at random and they're going to send a, send a box of beer out to you. So that is it, free beer, and that'll take you two seconds to do that. So I'll link up their Facebook page in our show notes at theretrohour.com. Uh, the competition closes on midnight on the 5th of July, and you'll find out the following day if you've won. Or if you just want to order some beers as well, have a look at the incredible selection on their website, beers.uk. That is B-E-E-R-Z.uk. Use our discount code RETRO, and you will get 10% off your first order. And a big thank you to the guys at Beers for supporting our show. And of course, please do support our sponsors. It really helps out the podcast. Now, lots of stories to get through this week. Um, <laughs> this one I found really interesting. You know, it's it's not very often I get magazines delivered through my door anymore. Obviously, I get Amiga Addict, you know, Ravi's magazine. Look forward to that every Hell single yeah. month. But now there is a way that you can get classic video games magazines delivered to your door. Yeah, I thought this in, was a really interesting idea. It's, it's called a blind box, and um, it's set up by the Video Game History Foundation. Um, I don't know if this is American only because it's in dollars, but I, I yeah. assume it's worldwide. I haven't gone through the payment process yet and checked it out. But um, what it is, is it's basically a random video game magazine that's sent to you. And the period is ranging from 1981 to 2010. So it could be any type of video game magazine. It could be about a system. It, and, you know... They all arrive. They're all benefiting the charity as well. It, it seems to be like a decent price. You know, you're paying $20 a month for this. Mm -hmm. uh, they've also said, you know, they've, they've got some really interesting stuff in there, like Nintendo Power Number 1. You could wow. get that with the poster to still attached. Well, I'm sure some of those magazines, like a Nintendo Power Number 1, is probably worth more than $20. Yeah. Oh, hell yeah. And, and they're not reprints. It's original. I'm assuming they've just got, like, stacks of like thousands of like classic magazines and you just get a random one sent out to you. They must do. And like they said that they're, they're, they're in loved condition, but they're also mm. ranging to like pristine, really good condition yeah, as well. Yeah, yeah. So, so they're not going to be totally wrecked. You're not going to get like one with missing pages or stuff like that. But they said, uh, some of the stuff are like Sega visions. I don't know if you've heard of that. A uh, computer game world, official PlayStation magazine as well. And, I think this is just so cool because, you know, when you guys find like a old vintage magazine and you look at it, it and it's from a different market as well, you kind of see like the stuff that was sold at the time, you know, the news, what was going on. I, I, always, for games, I always like seeing you know. the Toys R Us advertisements and stuff like that and seeing like all the classic games and how much they were. And sometimes I think I could go back in time and buy that, buy that, buy that because they're all worth so much more now. <laughs> I know what you mean. I do that as well. Mainly flick through the adverts in old magazines. Yeah, it's crazy because, yeah. you know, the prices stuff was going for then. You know, at the time we thought was expensive. Yeah. But now, you know, with, with retro stuff being often more than it was new. I've, I've got to say that I think this is a really good idea. Speaking as someone who had a huge collection of gaming magazines and computer magazines and then threw them all out about 10 years ago and has since been in the process of buying them all back again, at inflated prices on eBay. I got I half do, of I them, I could use like this. I got you half of actually, them because you were like, oh, I'm chucking all these Amiga formats out. So. <laughs> can, I, can I buy them back, Ravi? Yeah, I'll I, do I, a I, deal I twice as when much. You, I remember when you went on that call because you threw all your magazines away. Then you went to a local game shop in Nottingham and traded in a load of games. And then me and Ravi ended up buying some of those games from that shop. <laughs> but then I come around and I see them and I'm like, oh, what did I get rid of that for? <laughs> Well, you know, this blind box idea, it's well good. Imagine if they did like a blind box for floppy disks or they did a blind box for carts. Or, you know, they, mm, they do, actually. We've not mentioned it on the show before and I can't remember 
the name of the company. I think it's Video Games Monthly. But they actually do, you can pay like $15 all the way to like $55. And that depends what games, you know, how many games you'll get. And essentially they send you blind boxes of like Mega Drive games, Game Boy Advance games. Essentially you pick what consoles you put, you collect for. So I think that's interesting because obviously we've already got Game One's doing it now. Somebody's doing it with... Um, with magazines as well and did, and did you say it's coming from the, the video game history foundation as well so it's like proper legit yeah you're supporting them so apparently you know they get donated so many old magazines that often they've got a load of duplicates in their archives so it's really a way of you know making sure that they go to someone who's going to enjoy them rather than just having you know five copies of nintendo power issue one on the shelf gathering dust and, and some of the that, titles know. of these like they've got multi-format ones as well so like mm. electronic gaming monthly New Generation, Game Pro Games Players, Game Informer, Die Hard Game Fan. Like, I've not heard of half of these magazines. Yeah, I mean, I've got a feeling this might be an American-only service because, you know, obviously international postage is going to bump the price right up. Um, But, I I mean, if you can get hold of it outside the US, it's going to be an interesting way to read those magazines. A lot of these are already on archive.org, and they can go on and read the PDFs, but there is something about having the original paper issue of the magazine and even the smell do you remember getting the magazine and just folding about the cover and putting your nose in having a good sniff i don't I, think I they'll have that it. smell when they're pre-loved though. <laughs> <laughs> yeah after they've been in a teenage boy's bedroom throughout the 90s yeah <laughs> nobody wants to sniff that so um i'm sure we'll clean them up so if you want to subscribe to that i'll put, I'll put a link in these show notes to it at the retro hour.com now obviously today a lot of people play many of their systems and classic games using emulation but obviously if you're using a modern display you do get that annoying thing that either you get the black bars down the side because obviously you know video games back in the 80s and 90s they were all four by three in a square format that weren't in widescreen so playing it on a modern monitor you either get big black bars down the side or even worse you probably see this all over facebook and stuff people hooking their old consoles up and the picture is stretched to 16 nines so everything looks really fat on the screen it's when you get those cheap emulators as well. So you you buy like the little emulators off Amazon or something and uh, mm. little game systems and everything's stretched on it. And it just <laughs> never looks right, does it? Mario always looks a bit overweight when he's kind of stretched out. But if you want to see him actually stretched out to 16.9 or 16.10, looking in his original size, someone has actually made Super Mario World playable in proper widescreen format. Yeah, this is this has been done in a kind of a really focused way. You know, it's not just a kind of we've rehacked it. They've actually added the custom like stretching of the pixels and and the the level on it. Um, it I was going to say you can actually see more of the level as well. They've not. Yeah, yeah, not, you can see what's coming ahead. Yeah. Yeah. It's not a case of they've stretched it. You can actually see just more of the level. You can see what's coming ahead and stuff like that, can't you? Yeah, and they've actually kept the original pixel aspect ratio as mm. well. So like you said, you know, Mario's not going to appear like double width or anything like that. In fact, you know, cause I, that game, I, I do love Super Mario World, but it is one of those games where if you don't really know what's ahead, I mean, obviously a lot of us have played it for like 30 years now, so you kind of know what to expect. But it is one of those that when you're moving quickly, you can often get caught out by things just suddenly coming on the screen. So I imagine it might actually make it a bit easier to play. Yeah, I'm looking at it now and I'm thinking like that would be pretty cool to play. Like, you'd feel like a bit of a Mario god playing that. <laughs> well, he says um, he's, like, this kind of hack has even added wider aspect ratios. So, like, I've never heard of this. 21 by 9? Yeah, I, I I didn't know that one either. I was just like, am I missing something here? But, yeah, 21 by 9 is in development as well. That's like an ultra-wide one of them. I was going to think it's half the monitors. level or something with that. Or, or project, <laughs> the entire it, game. project it on a wall in a pub. Um, yeah, or on like free PC monitors or something like that, and you can see like half the level. That is very cool. And obviously, we know that Nintendo are a bit of a sucker for their copyrights. So um, it doesn't actually contain a copy of the game itself. You'll obviously have to provide that yourself. But you can go and download the, the hack, essentially. And you'll also need to run it on an emulator, which is called um, BS NES HD. Um, which is an emulator that actually has all this technology in there to kind of upscale these games to widescreen. Um, apparently, a lot of them don't look anywhere near as good as this, but obviously this this is actually a proper made version where he's gone in and actually retouched up the whole game to run in widescreen. So I think that's very cool. Actually, you know, looking at this, you know, when you're playing like modern, you know, like maybe your old games on a modern system, something like, you know, the... Um, the console library of the Super Nintendo that's on the Switch, it would be nice if they were kind of upscale like this as well, wouldn't it, rather than having the, the black bars? 
Well, yeah, it's clear that, you know, it can be done. It's just, you know, is it is it worth Nintendo's time? Because this has probably come, mm. you know, a project of love from the guy who's made it because of, obviously he's had to specifically go into Super Mario World to do this. It's not like a technology he's made for the SNES and then you can just stick it on any old ROM. Um, so, you know, but it would be nice if they did do it. You know, it was something I just assumed they did do back in the day, but obviously mm. my naivety. And, it, and it's not for everyone, is it, as well? It's like the purists aren't going to like it. They're always going to want the original yeah, yeah. screen mode and the CRT. This is for like a kind of weird in-between group that have widescreen TVs and want to have this like new kind of Mario experience. It's the same guys that run like, you know, upscale PlayStation 2 games to like, you know, 4K. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> stuff, yeah. We talked about With, with before, tons so. of filters on them on the emulators yeah. and stuff, yeah. <laughs> But yeah, I do think it's very cool. So if you want to get a hold of that, I'll link that up in our show notes as well. Now, let's welcome back a dear friend of the show. We've had on several times in the past, um, talking about, you know, the uh, history of first-person shooters. You wrote an incredible book called Rocket Jump, all about Quake a couple of years ago. Um, also, Arcade Perfect as well. And now he's working on a documentary that is going to be a love letter to first-person shooters, particularly classic ones from back in the day. So let's welcome back onto the Retro Hour podcast to talk all about the new FPS documentary, David L. Craddock. Hello, David. Hey, thanks very much for having me. Just when you think I'm gone, I come waltzing back in with some <laughs> new project. Happy to be here. Oh, you got your fingers in so many pies. You're a busy guy. I do. I haven't <laughs> even had time to taste them yet. That's how busy. <laughs> <laughs> well, I did mention then that you're now working on um, a documentary. Is this kind of a follow on from the History of FPS books that you did a couple of years ago? Tell us a bit about this documentary. Sure. It kind of sort of is. So a few years ago, I wrote Rocket Jump, Quake and the Golden Age of First Person Shooters, which explored, um, you know, focus on the Quake trilogy of games, but with an emphasis on other shooters from the 90s. And I've been working on a lot of other book projects since then. But earlier this year, I got an email from uh, Robin Block, who's the founder and CEO of Creator VC, this this company that makes uh, crowdsourced documentaries about uh, slices of popular culture, such as horror movies, sci-fi, now first-person shooters. And um, Robin said, hey, you know, we're working um, with a bunch of, of, of writers and producers, we, we know about Rocket Jump, and we'd love to to have you on as a, a special consultant. And I thought at first that meant, oh, they just want to want to interview me. I can be a talking head in the next documentary they do. That'll be kind of fun. Um, but as we got more and more involved in the project, they said we'd love to have you on as a producer. So I've joined the team. I'm help helping kind of a roundup talent and help uh, set the direction and focus of FPS first person shooter. Uh, working with a great team, Robin and several others. It's been a lot of fun. Well, why why is FPS such an important genre? You know, when I was growing up, uh, I was kind of platform agnostic when it came to games. I would play everything, but when you get a new computer or especially a new graphics card. The games you use to show off that tech are first-person shooters. FPS mm-hmm. games tend to be at the – they're kind of the vanguard of gaming technology. You know that the latest and greatest FPS is going to have the latest and greatest technology powering it. and It is going to be the best way to kind of show off your rig to your friends and really push your computer to the limits of what it can do. And um, FPS as a genre is very special – Um, But there are several reasons why we focused on it. I mean, first of all, going back to what I said about the tech, if you look at the evolution over the last 40 some years, we started with simple wireframe graphics in Maze, which is considered the first FPS to games like today, such as Overwatch and uh, Fortnite. They're just they push the 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 boundaries of technology and creativity and game design. And there's a little bit of FPS in almost everything. I mean, FPS has so many subgenres. There are turn-based first-person shooters. There are FPS RPGs. FPS kind of, uh, going back to what you said earlier, it has its own fingers in a lot of pies. And so there's a lot to unpack, a lot to explore, and we just can't wait to kind of share this this love letter to the genre and everything and everyone it's, it's touched and influenced along the way. And I think, you know, the longevity the genre's had as well, the fact that it is still really the predominant game genre, you know, for these big AAA titles, 30 years after Doom's like crazy, I think, you know, the fact, the fact that it's that, you know, developed all the time and the fact that they're always coming up with new things. 
Oh, it, it really is. I mean, as a matter of fact, the Doom community is still thriving. You know, games like uh, Doom 2016 and Doom Eternal are fantastic. But if you're still a fan of, I guess we call them now classic Doom, since there are so many, you can still fire up Doom 2 and play all sorts of mods from total conversions like the Alien and Star Wars mods to the Brutal Doom, which changes, you know, yeah, it adds a lot of like Mortal Kombat-esque blood and gore, but it also adds new weapons, new enemy AI, it becomes almost a whole different game. And really, I mean, I would say since Quake, which was considered one of the maybe the kind of at the forefront of competitive FPS, that's one of the reasons the FPS is such a popular genre now. Not only is it fun for casual gamers to play, but if you look at a lot of competitive esports, most of them are rooted in FPS games. Well, the trailer looks absolutely awesome. So uh, who features in it? Oh, we've got um, a, a really talented team, but as far as the all-star cast of game developers we're putting together, that's, I think, what's most exciting to me and the rest of the team. Um, we're talking with folks from from Dave LeBling, who was one of the original programmers of Maze War, to a lot of the id Software crew, you know, John Romero, Tim Willits, American McGee, uh, Sandy Peterson, these influential designers and games from, from Wolfenstein 3D to Doom to Quake, Tom Hall. We're also speaking with Scott Miller, the co-founder of Apogee and 3D Realms. We're talking to Cliff Blazinski about Unreal. We're talking to Randy Pitchford about uh, Borderlands, Half-Life, Halo. We're talking to a lot of designers from Bungie about Halo. I mean, there's... They're just we have over 35 developers so far, and it's just an all star cast. And we're going to be able to get so many opinions, so many thoughts, so many exciting stories that, uh, you know, many of which have never been told about FPS development and design. Are there any specific games that you've had to like really focus on to deep dive? Because I imagine if you did it, <laughs> you know, every every FPS, it'd be yeah. about twenty hours long. <laughs> <laughs> the cool thing about Creator VC making these uh, by fans for fans documentaries is that a lot of them actually do have long runtimes. We're looking at three or four hours, but like you said, even though that's a lengthy runtime, we can't possibly cover all of them. Our focus will really be on what we now call retro shooters. You know, kind of the the bedrock of the genre games that were made in the nineties. Obviously, we'll be spending a lot of time on id's games because they are that influential we'll also get into stuff like half-life duke nukem unreal because the cool thing about fps is as as you all know and as your listeners know it's not just about the game design it's about the the underlying tech and you know taking an engine like unreal now you see it used in almost every other game out there not just first person shooters so we'll be getting into that too but as far as the games themselves we can expect a heavy focus on the games from the 90s and I would say through the 2000s, early 2010s will be our focus. Well, you're doing this as a Kickstarter, and that begins um, next week, 29th of June, on Tuesday. Um, tell us a bit about the Kickstarter then, and any kind of rewards that you're going to be offering? Yeah, we have all sorts of fun rewards planned. I mean, first of all, June 29th is a special date to me. You know, I kind of got my um, my author chops as the author of Stay Well and Listen, the Diablo stories. And Diablo 2 launched on the 29th, so it's a fun anniversary. Mm-hmm. Um, but, as, you know, for the Kickstarter, we're kind of playing to that. Our documentaries are all about celebrating fans and the subject matter that we cover. So you'll be able to get uh, digital copies of the documentary. You'll be able to get box copies. And one of the premium rewards, if you remember PC games from the 90s and early 2000s, they came in those gigantic boxes that unfortunately uh, all the the wet blankets out there kind of put the kibosh on because they took up too much shelf space. Well, if you want one of those, (laughs) you can get one of those giant boxes, the big box uh, game type packages that the documentary will come in um, all sorts of fun stuff that we have planned and that's just kind of the tip of the iceberg well david i know you and obviously robin and the team incredibly talented and incredibly passionate about video games as well so uh, this is going to be a real love letter to the genre i'm sure so we can't wait to check it out i'll obviously put a link to the uh, the kickstarter in our show notes everyone should check it out um next week tuesday 29th uh, it's been a pleasure talking to you david and good luck with it we can't wait to see it Yeah, thank you very much. It's always a blast talking with you guys. And I think you hit the nail on the head. FPS, first-person shooter, is a love letter to this genre. I think gamers are going to love it. And again, we just can't wait to share all these exciting stories. Cheers, David. Now, what about this? Final Fantasy IX, which um, (laughs) I didn't realize that game now is 21 years old. Came out back in 2000. This is getting a uh, bit of an upgrade and being turned into a full animated series. Yeah, so I don't know how I feel about this. So obviously recently we've had like the Castlevania animated uh, release on um, Netflix, which to be fair is is a really good series. Like I really got into that. 
And you, you've watched it, yeah? Yeah, yeah, I've watched it. I've not finished the, the latest season yet, but I, I really enjoyed it. Um, I've been really enjoying it so far. And, you know, Resident Evil is becoming a Netflix series as well, which, you know, I, I can see why they're doing it because there's all these like hot commodities at the moment. And, you know, there's so many, like ga- gaming is like the biggest media in the world these days. So I, I can I kind of see it. And, you know, Final Fantasy has that real kind of like, anime look to it anyway especially number nine not every single final fantasy game does but nine does so i've, I've heard the rumor it is a netflix production but i'm not 100 percent sure on that um but it started it's you know slated to be going into development at the end of 2021 start of 2022 so we'll probably see it around this time next year but the thing is it's aimed to ages 8 to 13 apparently so you know it's kind of like that pre-teen kind of anime um, it's going to be, which I'm a little bit like Final Fantasy IX for me was quite a deep. I know you guys aren't big on your RPGs, but it was quite a deep, thoughtful RPG, <laughs> you know, like 100 hour RPG, which is obviously yeah. like, you know, 21 years old now, going to be 22 years old by the time we get this show, you know, but the, the producers of the company, um, it's, it's coming from a production company called um, Cyber Group and uh, Pierre C- Seisman, his name is, has said, you know, the games have got a strong have a strong co-viewing potential so it's going to be for those who know final fantasy 9 already and then it's also going to be an introduction to final fantasy 9 and final fantasy for the younger audiences so i guess the parents really yeah so kids. i guess it, you could argue parents kind of watch it with their children but is there going to be adult themes in it is there going to be a love story in it it's do you know what I mean? I mean, the Castlevania show is straight up gore fest and sex fest. So I know it's going to be... Not aimed at eight-year-olds. So obviously that's not aimed at eight-year-olds. It's going to be a far cry from that. So I'm a little bit like, oh, I don't know. Like, what's this going to be like? Because I Final Fantasy IX is one of my favourite Final Fantasy games. So it's going to be interesting to see what we do with it. But I'm not going to just, you know, be snobbish about it and be like, oh, no, it's aimed at eight-year-olds. Because, it, it, you know, it's still going to be... a Good show, something sure. something for you and your little one to watch in the future yeah uh, perhaps yeah. you know but you know put that positive spin on it kind of thing like i say i don't want to be negative about it but i'm probably being a little bit reserved about it but i'm sure it'd be an interesting watch when we do get it. you know i think your reservations are warranted actually because it is very difficult i think to create a show that actually appeals to eight-year-olds and their parents at the same time yeah yeah absolutely and also capture the magic of the original game Mm. you know I think- and, a, and a game and a game that's 21 years old which yeah. you know an eight an eight-year-old today is gonna have no idea what the game is which is why choosing that audience is an interesting choice i think yeah pugwash absolutely. pugwash the show was the only one that appealed to both <laughs> what captain pugwash yeah <laughs> if, you'll know why anyway i don't i don't know why but fair enough i will have to give that a rewatch as an adult <laughs> But yeah, I'm wondering about the art style as well. So I haven't watched the um, Castlevania series. What is that kind of a straight up like anime kind of look? Yeah, it's a straight up anime, but it's that kind of like American anime. So it's a little bit less cartoony. You know, it's got quite a, a kind of realism look to it, but still anime. But I'm wondering whether with this they go go CG or if they are going to go full anime with it kind of thing, um, which is what mm. I hope they do do, you know, because it, it's a beautiful game. So I want them to make the show look beautiful as well. Yeah, and I mean, a lot of people are saying that it could kind of give, you know, the, the franchise a bit of a shot in the arm and maybe even, you know, get a, a sequel game Yeah, to that made as well, which, yeah, you know. Yeah, that would be pretty awesome. And uh, it's interesting that they've gone for Final Fantasy IX. It wasn't the most yeah. popular Final Fantasy game, but it did sell 5 million units on the PS1, uh, it's saying here. So, you know, obviously it's a popular game. People are going to, you know, people are going to know Final Fantasy at least. So I'm, I'm interested to see if they call it like Final Fantasy IX, the animated series, or if they call it something completely different. Yeah, because I didn't realise, I mean, not being hugely into the franchise. I mean, I'm looking at the comments here on Nintendo Life, a lot of people saying, oh, the worst game in the series, why have they picked that one? Was it a bit divisive? I wouldn't say so, but Final Fantasy fans, they can be pretty brutal on some of the games. Yeah. You know, for me, I'm, I'm a fan of all of them, really. You know, and I'm a big Final Fantasy fan, but, you know, I can see why some people would prefer, you know, prefer some from others. Final Fantasy VIII is quite a bit of a black sheep, but I personally, I love Final Fantasy VIII. So I know people who really don't like nine, but I love nine. So, you know, I think it's just hard because seven was so popular to kind of like, you know, <laughs> eight and nine came out, seven, eight and nine came out really close together. And I think, you know, they were kind of, you know, sat in the shadow of seven a little bit. So I think a lot of people don't like eight and nine for just for that mm. reason. But I, I could be wrong, but I, I personally, I enjoyed, you know, all the Final Fantasy games really, other than 13, funny enough. 
So if you want to see more about that, we'll, uh, we'll keep you updated. That's all we know so far. No trailers or anything out there at the moment, but we'll put what we do know, that article on Nintendo Life, in our show notes at theretrohour.com. Now, we do have a Patreon that helps keep this show going. And, of course, you can help out this podcast and make sure that new episodes come out every single Friday. And that is the idea of our Patreon. We have it running. Think of it as a little tip jar. And it basically means that anything that we need to pay for through doing this show, equipment, websites, hosting, all of that is taken care for. Because when we've said it last few weeks, the big thing about our podcast and the thing that we're most proud of actually is that it is independent. It is us three guys. We haven't got a big media company above us dictating the content that we have to do. We haven't got anyone saying, oh, you need to be more commercial and not cover, you know, the kind of stuff that we talk about on this show. And we'd like to keep it that way. You know, I was listening to a, a podcast the other day and they said, oh, there's no one in the podcasting game. There's just corporations or there's just the man shouting in his living room. And I was like, we're, we're in the middle of that. <laughs> I was going to say, I'm probably the man shouting in his living room. <laughs> so you've moved up to the, the spare bedroom. I'm in the spare actually. bedroom now. Yeah, not lying on the floor anymore. <laughs> So the idea of our patron is, you know, you you help us keep this podcast coming out each week. You help us with the running costs of it. And in return, we give you some great little perks as well. Now, we had our patrons hang out again. We got a load of new faces in there, actually. We use Google Meets to do that. I think we're almost at growing the limit of people that we can have on Google Meet. So we might need to change that very soon. But it was amazing to see so many new faces there. And, of course, our regulars. And, again, I mean, our conversations just changed to all kinds of things. And we talk about retro games and systems, but again, went into a bit of movie chat, didn't we, on Sunday night? Chat about Fred Durst. <laughs> yeah, we were yeah. chatting about Fred Durst and Limp Bizkit. Yeah, we always proper go off on a tangent, don't we? We always kind of start with retro games. You know, we were also talking about um, limited run games, you know, what people have been buying recently. Um, but yeah, we, we often do come back to films as well, don't we? Because obviously no, yeah. we don't really talk about films on the actual show. But I imagine yeah. so many of our listeners have probably got very similar tastes in movies and stuff. And one of our guys on chat, Richie, just mentioned something about an old phone. And then that got into mini discs and MP3 mm. players. And we started talking about old mobile phones for about half an hour as well. Is it going to be the retro movie hour next? Yeah, maybe. <laughs> yes. <laughs> but look, we'd love you to join us for our next one. We do them once a month, so um, about four weeks until the next one. You'll find that on our patrons. And before that, we actually recorded the latest episode of our patrons' exclusive podcast, The Retro Hour After Hours. Now, it turns out we've kind of got this little bit of a routine now that every other episode will focus on a specific year. And we've been doing them in order, so we're actually up to the year 2001 and we did about an hour and a half about 2001. We didn't realise how much actually came out in that a year before we started A lot came out in 2001. I was about to say, spoilers, Dan, but you can just Google what came out in 2001. But the, or remember it. Or remember it. But yeah, that episode definitely could have been about four hours long, but we, we managed to get it down to about an hour and a half. Yeah, and but, you know, when we talk about these things, it like takes you back in your head and then you suddenly mm. realise, oh, there's more stuff that, that kind of came out. Like um, we're talking about, you know, CDs, when CDs were able to hold more tracks and you could kind of put MP3s onto CDs, that 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 was revolutionary. I forgot about that. Yeah, and the launch of, you know, obviously we had the, the Xbox, the uh, the GameCube out in that mm -hmm. year as well, the Game Boy Advance launch in that year, PlayStation 2 year before we said the Dreamcast on the market, the N64. I mean, it was actually a year when you look at it, the amount of new franchises yeah. and how packed game shops must have been back then. Yeah, you know? I don't remember that being massive that crossover. Like you said, it was GameCube yeah. and N64. There was Dreamcast, there was PS1 and PS2. You know, it, it yeah. was a crazy, crazy year, but um, it was awesome to, you know, get nostalgic and talk about it. You know, I think that on that show, the After Hours podcast that we do, obviously we we reminisce, you know, about our personal memories on this podcast, but that one is really all about that, isn't it? It is really, really nostalgic, the After Hours yeah, show. absolutely. We we, do, we we probably say too much. Like, sometimes we probably come across really wealthy, like, oh, yes, yeah, so in 2001 I had this, 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 and this. But it, Which we definitely weren't. <laughs> definitely, definitely wasn't the case, but yeah, it's and still really <laughs> awesome to, you know, knuckle down and talk about them. But that's not all we, that's not all we do. You know, like you say, we do that every other after hours and then usually we do something completely different in the other episodes. A Mega Drive special recently, yep. we did a Super Nintendo one soon mm -hmm. as well. So um, it's a really enjoyable show and hopefully you'll check it out as well and enjoy our second podcast that we do. You get the normal podcast ad free, you get it early most weeks too. Uh, but really the main reason that you're backing us on Patreon is just to keep this podcast coming out and make sure we can keep bringing you these incredible guests. And of course, for backing us on there, you will get a mention in the most prestigious high score table in the world of retro gaming, the Retro Hour Hall of Fame. And a big thank you this week to Dave Wilkinson. Scott Brian Frazier. Brian Brooks. Jim Weil. And Ollie J. 
who all backed us on Patreon. We massively appreciate that. And you can do the same on our website. You'll find the link at theretrohour.com. Now, we like to support independent retro gaming shops all around the world as well, something that you guys have been sending in, and please do keep them coming in. You can email us, show at theretrohour.com. We want to know, where do you buy your retro games locally? Let's big up these incredible independent retro gaming shops all around the world. Give them a shout out on the show, and hopefully new people are going to come along and check them out. And uh, this week, this is a shop in Plymouth called Revival Games. Yeah, Ashley let us know about this. Uh, Smash1980, he's a good contributor to the show in the patrons chat. And he said, uh, saw this in the news feed. It's miles away. I, I, I'm i miles away from Plymouth, but I thought it looked like an ace little shop. And uh, there's an actual article in Plymouth Herald about it. And it's called Revival Games. And it's a brand new shop, actually, which has just been set up and... It looks really fantastic by Paul Mattock. Yeah, this is on, um, I don't know Plymouth, but it's um, Faraday Mill Business Park it's on. It's out of the way, the busy city centre. Uh, there's actually an image gallery as well um, on this article here on the Plymouth Herald. This place looks really cool. There's loads in here. I'm looking here, the first thing you see is um, their nice presentation case with pretty much every variety of Game Boy in there. Yeah, man, they've got like every single Game Boy, absolutely hundreds of PlayStation and N64 games, which I love. Uh, but what's also cool is they sell a lot of um, retro toys as well. Um, mm. And I can also, I can see a Lynx one in the cabinet there as well, Dan. And I see He-Man and Battle Cat. I had that exact figure there when you I was go. a kid. You need to get down there, oh. Dan. <laughs> That's what he wants. Uh, have you guys seen the main photo where he's just got a stack of CRTs in the window, like a huge oh. stack? So you could even go and get some good displays from there. This this place looks absolutely awesome, and it's great to see a, a new store kind of opening yeah. up. You know, he's got an Atari Lynx there. He's got a few amazing box systems. Oh man, we need to go and visit this. Yeah, so if you're anyone near Plymouth, um, definitely check them out. They're called Revival Games. And like you said, I mean, obviously, retail's been hit really hard over the last year. So, um, you know, the fact that there is a new retro gaming shop popping up in 2021, I think, is incredible. So if you're anywhere near there, definitely worth a little road trip down to see them. And please do keep your mentions coming in for your favourite retro gaming stores, and we will give them a shout-out on the show. You can email us or do it on our social medias, show at theretrohour.com. Don't forget that listener survey as well. We need your opinions on the podcast. We want to know what you want to hear more of what you want to hear less of and we'll shape the show and make it even better for you and in return you could win a hundred pounds to spend on retro goodies again you'll find that at the retrohour.com right next we're going to delve deep back into the history of video games companies like activision coleco absolute entertainment i'm going to be talking to the legendary gary kitchen next on the retro hour podcast You're listening to the Retro Hour podcast and it is time to welcome on this week's very special guest. And today we've got a true veteran of the video games industry. Worked with so many legendary companies, including Activision, founded Absolute Entertainment. Today is back to making retro games as well with the new Audacity games that we need to talk about in just a bit. But let's welcome on our guest this week, Gary Kitchen. Hello, Gary. Hey, how are you? Yeah, very good, thank you. Thank you so much for joining us. Now, before we get into you know just some of the things that you've done in your career, because I think we could do a five-hour episode talking about you know all, all the things you've done over the last four decades. Just um, give us kind of briefly your initial start in the industry. Then, what like first got you into gaming and computers? Where did it all begin? Well, the mid seventies. We're really going to date me now, but that's okay. Seventy three. I went to college went to university, I entered for art, fine art, drawing, painting, because I that my whole life up to college, that was really where I really excelled. I did very little in terms of technology, a little bit here and there, but nothing sniffing. So I was in college and I got a job, a part-time job offered to me uh, by a company that was doing electronics. And it was a small shop doing digital electronics, which were just emerging. Microprocessors were just starting to come out in the consumer market and doing product development. So I took that job. You know, it was a part-time job, paid an hourly rate. What the hell, right? Had to pay for college. Since it was a small company, I got kind of tossed into the water without a life vest. You know, you have a four-person company and something needs to be done. You learn quickly. 
And I'm actually thankful for that because I, within a few months, was working on electronics, both from a hardware and a software stamp, eventually software standpoint. And I really got my career going, you know, through self-learning in the job. Eventually, about a year into that job, I switched my major in college to electrical engineering, switched to night school, and ended up working full-time during the day at this electronics job, part-time in the evening on my uh, EE, electrical engineering degree. And ironically, what I was learning at work was always ahead of what I was learning at school. I mean, this was the 70s. There were not a lot of sophisticated electronics or software courses. Microprocessors were barely being talked about. They, they were brand new. There was a little bit of digital electronics. But for the most part, I was way ahead of school in the job. That, that must have been a, quite a change going from fine art into electronics, <laughs> like a, a change of culture. Um, did it, did it kind of help you, though, this creativity with your programming? Well, it's so funny because I ended up, when the smoke cleared a couple of years later, I ended up in the perfect industry where I could combine both of my skills. <laughs> I, I ended up with something where I could combine my my art, my my eye for visuals, and the engineering side. It, it's like video games were made for me. It's really funny. I read that you reverse engineered the Atari 2600 as well to see how it worked. Yeah, I ended up doing that while I was working for the company. Originally, we did a couple of handheld toys before I got into video games. And these were microprocessor, 4-bit microprocessor-based toys in the late 1970s. Uh, we fortunately got into Parker Brothers, huge toy company. Monopoly is their claim to fame. And we ended up doing two toys for them that were four-bit microprocessors. I learned how to program creating those two toys. I had never programmed, and I was the guy left standing when they said, does anybody want to volunteer to program? Uh and then at the Atari VCS came out in 77. And by 78, we were seeing it really start to take over a lot of the electronic toy market. Uh, and we were working on handheld toys at that point. So I went to management and said, we should really look at this Atari machine. I went out and bought one, uh, ripped it open, and uh, reverse engineered it, figured out how it worked so that we could create games on it. So how, how did you get your first job like out of the toy industry, but, but then directly in the video game industry? Oh, in the video game industry. Well, I mean, I was at this small firm, the electronic toy work, the firm grew from four people, probably 20. Then, uh, and, and I was learning and achieving and learning and achieving and, you know, really progressing at a rapid rate. And then I suggested we get into games because I had seen the machine and, and knew its capabilities. And once I got into uh, reverse engineering it, that took about six months, still at that company. Then I wrote Space Jockey, which was my first video game. And that was an output of the reverse engineering process. And they, my the management of that company, I didn't own the company, management of the company would often made a deal and published Space Jockey and at that point, I went to them and said, look, I, I you know, I demand a raise. <laughs> I was making about $11,000 a year, I think, at that point. And they didn't want to accommodate me. So that's when I left. And that was probably 81. And as soon as I was out the door, my brother Dan and I started a software consulting service. And very shortly thereafter, I got contacted by Coleco because they were looking for someone to port the Donkey Kong game onto the Atari. And at that point in time, given I had reverse engineered it, I was, you know, one of one who was available to program that. All the other Atari programmers were either working at Atari or Activision, which had spun off. As far as independent programmers to program on the VCS, I think it was pretty much me. So <laughs> they hired me to do that, and then I was off and running in the industry. 
You know that Donkey Kong port that you did to the Atari 2600? You know, that that is, obviously to launch your career, that is a really big title. I mean, it was a very popular arcade game. And your version of it, I know, was considered very technically impressive because a lot of the Atari 2600 games had, like, you know, screen flicker and stuff on there as well, which yours didn't. So technically, how did you manage the port then? And were you given much assistance with it? Um, The only assistance I got was Coleco gave me a an arcade machine. So I had it in front of me. Um, I got nothing, you know, in terms of source or graphics from the arcade game. Fortunately, I had reverse en- engineered the machine and already written one game. So I was past the learning stage. I was starting to refine the type of techniques that I would use on the 2600. And, you know, it was just sheer... <laughs> Sweat, blood and sweat. I worked probably four months, 100 hours a week. I was on a tight schedule, as always was in the game industry, at least back then. The holiday season meant everything. I couldn't miss the holiday shipping season. And um, it was really a point of pride to me that I wanted it to look as much as it could like look like the arcade game, given the dramatic limitations of the machine. Not only was I schedule challenged, I was also ROM challenged because I did that game in a 4K ROM. And at that point, 8K ROMs were available. But Coleco was standing over me saying, we're going to sell every unit that we make, given what they saw of what I was doing. Um, It's just not worth the extra money per unit to go to 8K because they're going to sell every unit they possibly can at 4K. And I, and I had done a pretty good job on two of the four stages that were in the game. And to them, that was, you know, good enough. And I was out of time anyway. So it went out that way. I actually said you were one of the only people kind of doing arcade ports back then. Uh, you could have just really done it quickly and like, you know, slapdashed, got it out there. But um, your pride kept it at that high quality were you given a, a machine and were you given like the assets and uh, no, uh none, none of that i i got a machine but i got no assets so so you had to kind of reverse engineer that and, and do that yeah. yourself yeah, as well. I, yeah. I, I mean really the code would have been of no value to me it was 16 bit and i was working on an atari and the capabilities of the hardware i think were 128 sprites on the screen the atari had two so really, I had to just approach it as a new project, you know, and it was it was a massive hit for Coleco. They ended up selling about four million units uh, in the four or five months after it came out, Christmas of 82. And um, I, I read a, uh, a an analyst report on the company because they were public. And I read an analyst report for 1982 and, you know, they have a, a massive product line, Cabbage Patch Dolls and ColecoVision and all these other toys. And they had 550 toys in the market in 1982. And my little 4K cartridge represented 25% of the total revenue of the company. Wow. So they were happy. <laughs> I always find it interesting that obviously Coleco were making games for, you know, what was essentially their rival system, you know, their biggest rival. Was there any kind of resentment you know from Coleco that they kind of had to make 2600 games to earn you know as much money as they did yeah I mean it was purely a financial decision they they licensed the game from the Nintendo obviously and they would have been crazy at that point to not bother licensing the rights for Atari because Atari was 80 percent of the market so you know they would have left money on the table they were smart enough to know hey Yes, we want the Coleco Vision to shine. And yes, we're using this as the linchpin to launch our new console, but uh, you can't leave $100 million on the table. It always impressed me as well that the ports were, you know, well, the games they put out on the Atari 2600, like, you know, your version of Donkey Kong, were actually very good versions as well. They didn't kind of, you know, artificially make them poorer than the Coleco Vision versions, which, you know, some people might think they would. Well, well, you know, that's a massive rumor on the internet for years now i'll read on social media on facebook or twitter that oh everybody knows that coleco you know made the 2600 version terrible 
to make the Coleco sell. And I can't tell you how many times I have had to say, I'm sorry, that is just not true. I, I mean, I get a lot of grief even today from people who say, oh, the game was terrible. It didn't have all four screens. Now, people weren't saying that in 1982. It was a miracle that there was anything like that on the screen, <laughs> given the machine was capable of doing Pong. But in hindsight, a lot of people criticize it for not having all the levels. And, you know, it is what it is. I did the best job you could possibly do for the time. And and one other thing, my, the logic was <clears throat> vast majority of people who knew the arcade game had only seen the first two levels. I mean, yeah. what percentage of people who play the arcade game were able to defeat the first two stages and get to the third stage? 10% of them, maybe? So rather than having three or four ugly, bad playing stages, I focused on getting the first two very, very good. If I had more time and more ROM, I could have put in a third stage or a fourth stage. I didn't, but I wanted to make the first, make sure the first two were true to the machine. And I guess they were just happy to have it at home as well. Yeah. You know, and yeah, not I mean, have to I pump quarters in. Stores, I remember going in the stores and seeing people's reaction to it. You know, I, I think a lot of what's talked about online today is um, revisionist hindsight. And the funnest, most enjoyable thing I do on social media is I see one of these discussions going on about how terrible the port was. And then I insert myself at some point, just like some Joe who happens to be on Facebook. And I say, you know, I think the port was pretty good. And I wait for someone <laughs> nice. to recognize my name. <laughs> <laughs> how, how did you end up making the move to Activision? So I was working with my brother, Dan. At the time I was doing um, Donkey Kong, he was working on uh, Apple II software. We, we did a few Apple II games at that time as well. He was also working on VCS, but we were working on a number of things. And I was probably two, two months away from finishing Donkey Kong and thinking about what we were going to do next. So I picked up the phone and I called the main line for Activision. And the reason I did was it was, it was obvious to technical people like us that Activision was really raising the bar on the Atari 2600. I mean, the work they were putting out, you know, in the first couple of years was just incredibly better than what was coming out from Atari. And uh, we, we were duly impressed. So, you know, for us, it wasn't so much about where we're going to make the money as much as it was, who do we want to be working with? Who's making the best quality software? So I called them and I got eventually someone on the phone who ended up being vice president of product development. And he kind of had a, who the hell are you attitude? And I said, well, I'm working on the Atari 2600. And he didn't believe me because he said, no, you know, Atari people, Activision people write 2600. As far as I know, there's nobody else. And I said, well, I'm, I'm doing the Donkey Kong for Coleco. And he said, can I fly out and see you? <laughs> Suddenly knew it was real. So he came out, <laughs> we met, we went to California, we ended up joining Activision. We were also talking to Atari at the time, but we liked the feel of Activision. We had great respect for the founders and the work they were doing on 2600, and it was a great fit for us. I mean, Activision just seemed like, you know, the most cutting edge company in the industry at the time, I imagine, you know, this uh, group of ex-Atari renegades who went ahead and made their own thing better than what they were doing at Atari. Yeah, I remember I remember when the first Activision game came out, you know, Dan and I were avid players and I called Dan and I said, I was at Toys R Us and there's some game out for the Atari and it's not from Atari. And he was like, what the hell are you talking about? <laughs> so we went over to Toys R Us and we bought skiing, Activision skiing by Bob Whitehead, brought it home, sat down with our Atari and absolutely were convinced that it was going to be complete garbage. I mean, for God's sakes, it didn't come from the people that made the hardware. Yeah. And we put it in and we were blown away how good it was. And, you well, know, that happened with all of their titles. Those titles were so far ahead of what was being done on that machine. It was just completely amazing. 
Well, speaking of big titles, um, one game that you obviously worked on, Keystone Capers, um, which was a very interesting concept. Um, where did the idea of that game come from then? Well, I finished Donkey Kong and I was kind of in a little man running mode in my mind. <laughs> so I said, you know, I'm going to do a game with a little guy running. What should he be doing? And I decided I wanted to do a game that was that had an element of fun, comedy to it, you know, a little comedic. And I thought of the Keystone Cops, the old uh, silent movie um, slapstick shows. And as much as anything, uh, I mean, we laugh, but back in that day, a lot of the concept was driven by, can I make the main character on the screen that he looks recognizable. And, you know, if I came up for for a game for, you know, a doctor and I rendered a doctor on the screen in 2600 and people looked and said, what the hell is that? You wouldn't do the game. But I thought of a Keystone cop. I put him up on a screen. I, I put the, the, the bowler hat, you know, very signature hat and he's holding, uh, you know, his stick Billy Club, and he looked like he looked like Keystone Cop, and I said, "Hey, that works." <laughs> and I went from there. And I had been playing around on the machine, trying out different ideas, and I had uh, done the escalator, which was a, a really cool technical effect on the twenty six hundred. And I had the escalator before I had the game, and I said, "All right, I've got this guy." He looks like a good Keystone cop. And I have this cool escalator. And that brought me to the department store. And it was fortuitously beneficial that doing a crook was very easy because you could just stripe him in white and black. And he was very recognizable. So he was off and running at that point. Is it is it true you had to cut the game down? I heard there was like a 6K oh, my version. Boy, it, was, it was brutal. It was... <laughs> I mean, that was the case with all of them. I had to cut down Donkey Kong, too. I mean, Donkey Kong was, I think, I had what you see in Donkey Kong, I had working, and it was probably 2K over the 4K limit. It was probably 6K at one point, and I had to cut 2K out of 4K. Um, and, And I've said in other interviews that, honestly, that's my favorite thing out of everything in programming is cutting bytes. <laughs> I just, I enjoy optimizing code. So yeah, with Keystone Capers, at one point, I had this beautiful, like Model T style uh, cop car in parked in front of the department store. And you saw that as a title screen and it was gorgeous, but I had to go away because I couldn't fit it. So I took it out and I, I did other optimizations to get it down to 4k and it was 4096 bytes and the last optimization i used the last byte there were no bytes left in the rom that must really teach you to be a you know really tight efficient programmer yeah it, it it is and and i really enjoy it i mean and you know we even did the same level of optimization david and i on circus convoy which we just released we're still doing yes. it uh, I mean, it's just, it's it's kind of in our blood. Well, one very interesting and pioneering product you released at Activision was uh, Gary Kitchen's Game Maker, which was a collection of tools for people to develop their own games with, um, which, you know, was quite different from Activision's output at that point. What was the story with that product? Yeah, that that was interesting. You know, the the console business in the U.S. crashed in 83, 84. There was a glut of product. Uh, Atari wasn't gatekeeping the quality of the games. There were some games coming out that were so bad they weren't even synced to the vertical of the TV, and and they kind of rolled when you turned them on. You had to adjust your TV because there were too many too many lines on the screen. So there were real problems. And uh, you know, one Christmas there were thirty million cartridges selling for two dollars in the retail space, and that just killed the industry. Everyone knows that story. So in 84, 85, there were some big changes in Activision. I mean, in my opinion, Activision management overreacted. 
and basically said, arcade games are dead. Action games, the type of games we've done are dead. That's over. So you've got to think about computers and you've got to think about more cutting edge creativity stuff and things like that. More cutting edge, less straight arcade. And um, it's funny because I was working on a, on an action game that I really liked on the Commodore 64. And um, I put it aside based on, on this strategy coming from the top. I put it aside and I worked on Game Maker because it was completely different and, and a new concept. And it took about a year. I had another programmer helping me, a team of artists. And, uh, you know, I really think that Game Maker was the best work I ever did. And I've always been disappointed that at that, at that point in time, the industry was build a game, release it, move on to the next game. And today, it's build a product, put it out, and then enhance the product, work with the product, put out revs, and the product lives for years. I wish we had done that with Game Maker. I mean, it came and went so fast. I, I you know, I, I wish that it's something I could have continued to work on. I could have seen versions on consoles. You know, I think it would have ended up being a very important product. It's a kind of product that would have had a, a good shelf life, you'd imagine. It could have kept going for years. Yeah, could have kept going for years. I mean, I still get two, three, four, or five emails a month from people saying, why don't you put Game Maker on the iPhone? Why don't you put Game Maker, <laughs> you know, on a present day console? You know, and I always think about that. I always think about what amazing things you could do if you started with that concept and took it further given today's technology and connectivity. And, you know, it, it actually takes me to Roblox a lot because Roblox is this large creative community of people who create games. No, it's actually the people who are doing the creating are a small subset and most people are playing. But to me, it's, it's not that far away from where I probably would have taken Game Maker. Was there much resistance to it, like kind of giving the users the power to create a game? Because you look at, like you mentioned, Roblox, but also stuff like Unity nowadays and uh, huge engines that people can use. Um, was there kind of a, an idea of let's keep this within the industry? No, 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 not at all. Activision was very supportive of it. And the people that reviewed it and used it absolutely loved it. But it didn't get the legs. It didn't. I, I mean, I think it probably did 60, 70,000 units, which was fine on the Commodore at that point. But it certainly wasn't a hit. And, um, you know, I, I think it, it was just that mentality of the day of, you know, do a nice marketing campaign, which Activision did, give it a month and move on. And I think, you know, the product could have really had legs, had the market been in a different place, but it really wasn't. If I had gone to management and said, hey, I want to keep working on Game Maker. I want to put it on other platforms. I want to expand it. I mean, that, that, that sort of strategy wasn't even on anybody's radar at that point. In terms of industry recognition, I mean, you actually got Designer of the Year award for, that, for Game Maker as well. So from your peers, I guess they saw the value in it. Yes, and I also got a Software Publishers Association Excellence in Software Award. And I've seen a number of articles where people have identified it as one of, or maybe the earliest uh, API uh, system uh, for making games, really an um, integrated development environment uh, for making games. You know, it, it certainly was one of the earliest. And the fact you had your name in the title as well, I thought was, you know, very interesting. Was that kind of part of Activision's strategy of making the programmers famous and giving you credit for it? Yeah, I, I think in that case, they didn't discuss it with me. I think in that case, because it was a game, a game making tool, they wanted to tie it to a recognizable name who was an accomplished game designer to give it more credibility. I, I, I think that's what they were trying to do. You know, whether it worked or not, who knows? It was nice, but I just read an article yesterday. It was actually an academic article 
talking about the game industry, they made a common mistake. They talked about Game Maker, and then they said years later it was revived, and then they referred to the other Game Maker, which is you know the program that's out today that you can create games. That's obviously a different product, no relation to mine. But unfortunately, the name, you know, eventually was taken over by another product. Well, in the end, you, your brother Dan and David Crane, um, kind of founded Absolute Entertainment in uh, 1986. Uh, why did you end up leaving Activision to start that company? Well, when we left, we left Activision in '85, and I mean, it was really they had lost their way, as I say, they. Um, made this knee-jerk reaction that video games were dead. I mean, that wasn't the problem of the industry, but it was their reaction to it. We're going to shift over the computer well, computer software, and computer software couldn't cover a tenth of the revenue that was needed. I mean, it was still very, you know, early in computer software. And management changed. Jim Levy, who had been our CEO for the glory days, was not there anymore. Guy came in, we didn't think he had the creative vision, and company was really hurting financially. So I went to them and said, look, why don't we spin off and go on our own? I suggested it. And I had an office in, in New Jersey that had a group of people. Uh, my brother Dan, John Van Risen, who ended up creating Hero, uh, which was a beloved 2600 game. And... um they agreed, and we spun off as a separate company. We did a distribution deal with them for a couple of years. When I joined Activision in 82, I immediately just struck up a friendship with David Crane. We found we worked very well together. We could read each other's code, could finish each other's sentences, really thought the same. So when we left in 85 to found Absolute, um, Dave did not come with us. He stayed at Activision. I mean, he was a founder. It would be a bigger shock for him to leave. And he stayed on for another year, year and a half. And then he came out and joined Absolute uh, after maybe a year and a half. Well, you focused heavily on the NES at Absolute. Did, did that system kind of seem like a rebirth of the industry after the crash? Oh, it, yeah, it absolutely did. I mean, it was, uh, you know, it was very hard for Nintendo – for Nintendo to launch that system. The retailers had a sign on their door that said no video games. And Nintendo walked into Toys R Us and said, we're going to sell a video game system. And Toys R Us almost threw them out. So then they went back and they put a robot in the box and said, it's not a video game system. It's a home entertainment system. Look, see, it's got a robot. And that worked a little bit. And finally, what to get it in a market, they had to tell Toys R Us that it, they would give it to them on consignment, that if it didn't sell, they'd take every unit back. And they did a test market only in the New York area. Fortuitously, we were in the New York area. So they did a test in the New York area, Christmas of 85, and it sold like crazy because nobody told the consumer that video games were dead. <laughs> they loved video games. It's just that, that, you know, they wanted something new and they wanted something exciting and they got it with the NES. So by early 86, it was clear that it was going to take off and we got right on it. Well, you were also uh, an early supporter of CD-ROM. Was there like um, much resistance to the technology with like cartridges being massively popular on systems like the NES? Well... Honestly, we were in our earlier supporter of CD-ROM, but I'm still licking my wounds from Sega CD because we decided Sega CD came out as an add-on to the Genesis. And we dove in big on it and did a number of titles and it didn't sell and Sega pulled the rug out from under it pretty quickly. And it really hurt us from a product standpoint because we had bet the farm on on the future of that technology. Uh, soon after the PlayStation came out and CD-ROM really established itself as the predominant platform for that sort of product. But um, it was a rocky start. 
It, it took a while yeah. to kind of get established and have stuff like, um, you know, streaming video off it and yeah. uh, those technologies. But what, what was it like in those kind of early days trying to get stuff working? Did you have to work from the ground up pretty much? Oh, yeah, it was it was crazy. Around that time, in the 85, 86 time frame, um, in New Jersey, there's a very famous uh, research lab called the David Sarnoff Research Center. David Sarnoff is an engineer who founded um, RCA, Radio Corporation of America, you know, 100 years ago. And um, RCA uh, had this huge lab uh, where the um, NTSC television standard was created uh, and color. So color TV was created there and the liquid crystal display was created there. It's a giant R and D facility and um, RCA contacted Activision in 86 and said, look, look, we're working on some new tech that may be applicable to games. Can you lend us somebody to work with us? from the game application side. So since I was in New Jersey, I ended up consulting with RCA Labs, Sarnoff Research Center in, I would say, 86, 87. And they were building CD-ROM technology to do full motion video. And as far as I know, they may have been the first. They they had some amazing tech. They introduced... Uh, after I worked with them for a year and a half on the application side, not on the actual tech, but they introduced at the second Microsoft CD-ROM conference, they introduced something called DVI, Digital Video Interactive, that streamed 30 frames a second NTSC video off of CD-ROM. I was very excited to be part of that uh, project, and it certainly um, ended up you know, foreshadowing what was to come in the industry. I mean, I remember the first time I saw, you know, video, admittedly in a very small right. you know, postage stamp size window, right. but it looked, it blew my mind when I first saw it, you know, because we'd never seen anything like that before. Yeah. I mean, once in a while, I'll be sitting here holding my iPhone with its seven inch screen, watching a movie in high definition. And I'll just stop and say to myself, wait a minute. <laughs> <laughs> you know, could you have ever imagined 20 years ago, 25 years ago, that you're sitting there holding a high definition television? that, you know, weighs less than, you know, half a pound. <laughs> Maybe in Star Trek. <laughs> yeah, that's exactly right. It's just, it's mind boggling. Yeah, and you look back at what you needed then, like, you know, huge MPEG plug-in cards and everything back right, in the day. It was crazy. Right. <laughs> right. Well, one big title that you had, obviously, um, and I was a huge fan of this game as a kid, Bart versus the Space Mutants. And, you know, at the time, early 90s, Bart Simpson was the coolest kid on the planet. Oh, yeah. So what was the story with uh, what was the story with that game? So we talked about the NES launching in 85, 86. One of the first people who recognized its uh, its potential in, in the U.S. market was Greg Fishback, who started a claim. And I knew Greg because he had been the vice president or he had, he had been the president of Activision International in uh, the 85 time frame. And he left Activision somewhere around the time that I did. And I kept in touch with him. He actually was on the East Coast. And um, he immediately started a claim, went to Nintendo and became the first U.S. licensee, publisher. And um, I spoke to him periodically. I, you know, the claim was doing great guns then, but they were only bringing titles in from Japan. It's a little-known story that Nintendo initially didn't believe that you needed to create products in North America. I met with them in early 86, after I could see how well it did in 85 at uh, Christmas, I went up to Seattle. I met with NOA and introduced our company, David Crane, myself, and my business development guy. And we said we wanted to make games for the NES. And they said, why would you want to do that? And we said, well, you know, I develop games for the platform. And they said, you don't need to do that. There are a thousand games in Japan. You do not need to make games in North America. Just license games. I tried to explain to them cultural differences and you know, games that may make sense over there wouldn't make sense here. They were resistant. And I went back to Seattle probably three or four times in 86. 
And we had very cordial meetings, very good relationship with them. And sometime around the mid 86, uh, Jim and I, the vice president of product development, and I, I mean, the vice president of business development, and I walked into Nintendo for a third or fourth meeting to try to convince them. And they threw a contract on the table and said, all right, we're going to let you develop for the platform. And we were the first North American company to be licensed to develop on the NES. Greg had started the claim. He was publishing other people's games from Japan. We were the first NES developer. And they explained to us, you have the license to do it, but the development system costs $35,000 and it's completely in Japanese. So best of luck. And we said, well, can we make our own development system? And they agreed. And we ended up making our own development system, which we marketed to other companies in North America and um, really got it off the ground in North America because of our persistence of talking to them. And I've had a a wonderful relationship with Nintendo since then. Uh, But uh, anyway, so we were the, the early developer on the platform in North America. Greg Fishback called me 1989, 1990, when The Simpsons was still little vignettes on the Tracy Ullman comedy show. There were five or 10 minute vignettes. And he said, I got the rights for a game for this crazy show. Watch it and tell me what you think. And I watched it and you could immediately see the appeal of Bart. And um, I signed on with him. He was, I was very fortunate. He trusted me to get it done. And um, we ended up doing five Simpson games for Claim. They did very well in the market. It was a great opportunity for us to work with Greg, and I think he was pleased with the outcome. Well, I thought the concept was quite interesting um, because it was like two layers of game. You had uh, the aliens with the kind of uh, in the background, and you put the 3D glasses on, and and the kind of aliens would emerge. It was a bit like B movie. Uh, style uh pretty novel where did that concept come from well you know it's really funny when he asked me to watch the show i didn't know the simpsons i didn't know matt graining you know i I mean virtually no one did it was just on this tracy ullman show so i called a friend of mine who worked for warner who i had gone to college with brilliant creative guy who was very very involved in films, TV, comics. I mean, this guy was a wealth of knowledge. And uh, his name was Barry Marks. He was my good friend from school. And I called him, I said, Barry, what do you know about this thing on Tracy Ullman? And he gave me a 10 minute dissertation on it, who was creating it, that it was gonna be a TV show. James L. Brooks, one of the most powerful people in Hollywood was gonna produce the TV show. And he just had all the backstory. So I hired him. I said, well, I need you. I want to come work in the game industry. He didn't know the game industry, but he sure knew Hollywood and uh, story development. So I immediately brought him in and he and I developed that storyline. And we spent many, many hours kicking around ideas. And somehow the two of us, and I don't know which one of us it was, we were talking about comic books and we remembered that last page on the inside of comic books when I was a kid and he was a kid you always got to the last page and it was all these cheesy little ads, tiny little ads, <laughs> dozens of them on the page. Like, like gain muscles and uh, That's stuff right, like that. Muscle. And one of them was the 3D, was the 3D glasses that let you see through women's clothes. <laughs> you know, it yeah, shows the x-ray kid, specs, yeah. Yes, the those. x-ray specs. You know, it shows a kid looking at a girl, you know. And we both agreed that was something Bart Simpson would buy. So that's really where the concept came from, was from those x-ray specs. And then we, you know, well, what's he looking at? He's not looking at girls. What's he looking at? And then we thought of the aliens. And years later, someone told me that there was a John Carpenter movie that had a very similar concept. I'd never seen the movie. I didn't know it even existed. But (laughs) um, the concept of the glasses being able to see aliens inside people had been done before. And I love the fact as well, you know, as a fan of the show as a kid, the fact that all the other characters were in there and there's a lot of kind of hidden Easter eggs. I remember you could um, you could prank call Mo 
you know, on the the, the phone booth at the start of the game oh, if I you put a coin that. in it. And yeah. yeah, there was just so many little hidden treats for the fans in there as well. Yeah, yeah. And, and that was really something that Groening and Brooks really insisted on. They wanted to make sure it wasn't 100% Bart-centric, that there was a lot more in there about the entire family. They kept saying, you know, this is the Simpsons family. This is not just Bart. And we really, really enjoyed that. And and that was, you know, something that Barry really got passionate about is making sure that we were true to the Simpsons universe when we did it. Well, speaking of movie licenses that you worked on, um, one of the biggest movies of the time, Home Alone for the Super Nintendo. Um, what memories have you got of that project? <laughs> None good. <laughs> <laughs> it was, I was talking to somebody about that time of the of the industry the other day this insanity in the industry of i'm going to start a project in june and i need it for christmas you know that that it, it, we're actually lucky the industry survived that stuff and it, games constant constantly being shipped before they were ready before they were done i mean i'm sure you guys know this <laughs> it's not yeah. a secret and um That was one of those cases. It was THQ. They came to us late with the license. There were only only a few months to do the game. I had someone working on it as lead programmer, and he melted down. Couldn't take the schedule. Couldn't get it done. Just the pressure was was too much. So I, um, I had to dive in, and I wrote a lot of that code. And I remember doing it under enormous stress and strain. And um, yeah, it was a nightmarish project for sure. And I I am so glad that the industry, I think, has gotten better than that. And the game that Dave and I just finished, Circus Convoy, the best thing about that game was it took three years to do. And there was nobody standing over us saying it has to ship for any particular date. We didn't finish it until it was finished, until we said, it is perfect. We've put everything in it that we want. And that's the way you should develop a game. Well, you and David Crane also uh, founded Skyworks Technology in 1995, and uh, that was like a really early company in internet gaming. Did you see some like huge potential with the internet back then? Yeah, yeah, we really did. And what we saw more than anything was um, there was a a great challenge in the cartridge game space, you know, back in the time of The Simpsons, early 90s, where you had a lead time of 10 or 12 weeks to get cartridges. And obviously cartridges have silicon chips in them and they're expensive. So you had expensive inventory and you had a delay. You couldn't get it instantly. It took 10 or 12 weeks. So you would estimate how many units you need, order four months before the holidays, import it in, put it on the market, and it may sell through real fast. But at that point, you don't have enough time to reorder and get stuff in for Christmas again. Or it doesn't sell and you're stuck with tons of (laughs) units. So inventory management of hard goods was very hard in the game industry. Until CD-ROM, because with CD-ROM, they were lower cost and you could turn them around in a matter of days. So in 96, 95, 96, when we started Skyworks, we were really focused on we want to deliver games digitally. We don't want to deliver physical goods. We want to deliver games digitally. No inventory, no markdowns, no returns. It was, we were looking at it purely from what is the best way to deliver games to consumers. And that's really what we focused on. And you were about 10 years ahead of the curve there. Yeah, we were. And, and, and we had to figure out how to make money out of it because, as you know, for the first, I mean, it's even true today to some extent, but for the first so many years of the World Wide Web, you know, the business model was free, free, free. Just everybody mm. wants everything free. Free didn't work for us. so. We really were very early in working with major advertisers to bring sponsorship into light, fun, small footprint games, uh, which when the Wii came out, 
There was a name for it. There was casual games. Before that, it was just free internet games. But we did a lot of free internet games that had major sponsors in them. So we, we got the revenue through advertising. Well, Gary, bringing things forward to today, um, you know, we can't wait to talk about this. Audacity Games. Now, your long-running partnership with David Crane continues, and your brother Dan as well. And you've now gone retro with a new game studio, and just seeing, you know, if I go into your website here, seeing an Atari 2600 game with your name and David's name on there, that is just incredible. So tell us where the idea came from to do a retro game studio, and what's the mission of Audacity Games? Isn't it ironic that we're? I just finished giving you a big speech on how we wanted to get away from physical packaged goods. <laughs> <laughs> and here we are launching a physical packaged goods game. On cartridge. <laughs> Boy, it's really strange, isn't it? <laughs> so anyway, you know, what was it? 10, 12, 15 years ago, people started doing homebrew on the Atari. 10 years ago, maybe. Yeah, they started hobbyists fooling around, putting out some homebrew games. And then Atari age started getting some programmers to do games and they started publishing limited edition games. And with that going on, David and I are often asked to go to these shows and speak or sign autographs, meet people. And we love doing that. We have a great time doing it. And we do it a few times a year. Well, more and more people would ask us, Hey, did you ever think about writing another Atari game? And we would just look at each other and laugh because, you know, you look back on it and you say, I mean, it was really the most fun we ever had making games was making Atari games because that platform is just really fun to work with. But, you know, you would look back on it and forget how hard it was to do. It's incredibly difficult. I mean, really incredibly difficult. And I would say to Dave, hey, maybe we should knock a game out. And he'd go, do you hear what you're saying? It took us a year to do a good game on that platform. Why do you think suddenly that we could do it in two months? What's changed? And he was right. You, you really can't. So we never really considered it. And then about three years ago, um, a website was put up called 8-Bit Workshop. I don't know if you've ever seen it. It's a Java-based integrated development environment for 8-Bit games. Mainly the VCS is all I cared about. And I stumbled on it. I read an article and somebody mentioned it and, and I went to it. And you bring it up and it's running Javatari, which is a Java emulator, Java VCS emulator. And to the left of the VCS screen, it has an editor and compiler. So you can literally write line by line 6502 code. It compiles while you're typing. And on the right, you get a VCS display. And there are, you can download a couple of example code and stuff. And now you've taken it and you've put it right in our face. Because we always used to say, well, even if we were going to do it, what tools would we use? So I called Dave up and I said, you have to see this website. And we both looked at it and laughed about it. And we started fooling around with it. And somewhere in there, I, I introduced my brother Dan to the website. I told him about it. All of us jointly kind of decided, you know, we should do something. We should do it in our spare time. I mean, we're busy. We have real jobs, but do it nights and weekends. And Dave and I decided not to tell anybody we were doing it. Dan went out about a year in, about a year and a half ago, maybe two years ago, and started talking about a title he was working on. Dave and I, we said, we are not telling a soul until it's real. We do not want to promise anything because we may never finish it. And we worked on it for three years. And um, we really, Dave's mantra the entire time was, if it's not the best game that's ever been done on the platform, I don't want to do it. So that's why we worked on it three years. We made it as deep as, far deeper than any game that's ever been done on the platform. And we spent an enormous amount of time developing new technology to make the graphics look better, there's some graphics in there that people look at and just say, I can't believe that's an Atari. And um, when it was done, we announced the company. We didn't give anybody a hint that it was done. We, we made an announcement that we had this company and we would eventually be releasing 2,600 cartridges. Lo and behold, a week later, we announced this cartridge and people were like, oh my God, they actually have a finished game? 
And by that time, by the time we announced the company, we already printed boxes. Yeah, you know, I love that you've actually had to put like contains no hardware acceleration because it looks so good. And also the implementation of stuff like QR codes. um, Oh, is that amazing or what? That was all Dave. Displayed so you can transmit the scores to the server. Like that's that's amazing. (laughs) I mean, we, we essentially connected it to the internet to post high scores. And it's like science fiction. It was such a brilliant idea by Dave. And if you ask Dave, what's the hardest thing you've ever written in 40 years of programming? He will tell you that it's the implementation of the QR code for the high score. Because (laughs) that's an industry standard and it uses advanced mathematics. Like advanced mathematics, like six levels above an 8-bit 6502. And it took him a couple of months to do it. And it's it's a miracle on uh, 2600. That, well, the reception I've been seeing for Circus Convoy, I mean, all the YouTube videos I've seen, the articles, everyone's mind's just blown about this. So t- tell us a bit about the game itself then. You know, we spent a long time thinking about what to do. And we ended up, once again, with a little man game. And, and Dave would talk about it. And then I would create some art. And creating art on the 2600 is not drawing. It's a very technical process. And artists isn't going to do us any good because they'll draw something we can't display. So I have both the knowledge of the programming as well as the art. So I focused more on the art. And I created a character. And then we talked about where he is. And we came up with 18-wheelers. And we said, yeah, but as an 18-wheeler, can we even do it on the 2600? Can it look good? So I spent a week and I created the cab with the guy sitting in the cab and Dave wrote code for it to drive across the screen, which is completely ridiculous on the Atari. And we had that and said, yeah, we can do this. And we kept pushing the envelope, adding characters, adding levels. The game is about 250 screens. It has six mini games that are contained inside the trailers. You unlock trailers with keys or other special tricks. You go in and you play mini games and it has an entire inventory management system with um, a dozen things that you can find and use and control. And it's all done with a single joystick and a button. And and that's just amazing. I love the fact as well that you really support the homebrew community. I mean, I'm looking on your website now and you offer stuff like, you know, circuit boards and cartridge plastic and blank labels even for people to make and publish their own games too. Yeah, uh, because, you know, we didn't do it to make money. We're not going to get rich on Audacity Games. You know, be lucky if we even break even on it, even with the great reception. That wasn't the point. The point was we did it because people begged us, wanted us to do it. And we really wanted to give the community, something to celebrate, you know? I mean, homebrew games are fine, but everybody was so hopeful to get something really exciting. And that was really the heartwarming part is all the responses from people that said, my God, I feel like I'm 10 years old again, waiting for the (laughs) Christmas tree so I can open my game. People just loved the concept of what we did. And for us, it was a blast. We really enjoyed it. You know, the plastics were a big problem. You can't get those plastics. You have to go through a tooling process. And we finally just bit the bullet and said, forget it. And and we had a tool made. We paid the money, had a tool made, uh, have the plastic made overseas, shipped in. So there is now a source for the industry for 2600 plastic. And it's us. And, you know, we had to do it because it was standing in the way of really making a product line. Well, it is incredible. Um, and I see, you know, that there is other projects that you're working on as well. Uh, your brother Danny's got um, Casey's Gold. Yes, Is Casey's that going to be your Gold next release then? Just looking amazing. He had started working on a game like that at, at uh, Activision. As the industry crashed, the game he was working on was a sequel to Keystone Capers, where Keystone Kelly was now tracking down uh, the robber on a train. And he was running on the roof and jumping from uh, train car to train car. And um, when I told him about 8-Bit Workshop, he started thinking about reviving that concept. But we don't have the rights to Keystone Capers. So 
he made it another character and it's not about a cop and a and a crook it's it's about finding uh, stopping a gold heist on an old western train and what he has so far is just amazing but because it, he's doing it by himself at least till recently um dave and i were able to get more done because we were working together we're now shifting resources to help him finish up Casey's goal. And it's going to be great. Fantastic. Well, Gary, it's amazing that you guys are back together and, you know, kind of going back to roots and releasing for the Atari 2600 again. Um, if you want to check out the site, adgm.us. It's been an absolute pleasure talking to you for the last hour, Gary. And it's amazing to hear the passion that, you know, you've still got for the industry and amazing that you're back doing retro stuff again. So thank you so much for coming on. Thanks for having me. It was really enjoyable.